in a hall in Stonington, in the land of the Wurundjeri, a mishmash of people of all backgrounds and races, of faiths and beliefs, getting together to celebrate the birthday of Bahá'u'lláh. Tonight we have a lovely program for you. We've got beautiful devotions and music. We have a little about the life and story of Bahá'u'lláh. And of course, we have wonderful company. I hope you enjoy this evening. We're honestly just very happy you're here celebrating with us tonight. We'll begin the evening with some devotions. The call of God hath been raised, and the light of his countenance hath been lifted up upon men. It behoveth every man to blot out the trace of every idle word from the tablet of his heart, and to gaze with an open and unbiased mind on the signs of his revelation, the proofs of his mission, and the tokens of his glory. Help them, O God, in their endeavour, and grant them strength to serve thee. O God, leave them not to themselves, but guide their steps by the light of thy knowledge, and cheer their hearts by thy love. One of the main teachings of Baha'u'llah is that the world is but one country and mankind its citizens. Baha'u'llah is the most recent of these messengers. And according to the Baha'i faith, all of these messengers and religions do not conflict with one another, but they build on the spiritual message that the former messenger has brought to humankind. So it's almost like each religion or message are different chapters of a single book that uh, reads the guidance, the spiritual guidance of humanity. The main message of Baha'u'llah is that we need to establish unity in diversity. And because of such uh, a powerful revolutionary message, the clergy and the government of Persia were infuriated. And Baha'u'llah was made to endure around 40 years of suffering, exile, and imprisonment. Baha'u'llah proclaimed himself publicly to be the bearer of a spiritual message to humankind that would impel humanity to its next stage of spiritual development, which would usher in an age of its collective maturity. I have so often been asked how I first came to occupy myself with a study of Eastern languages in France or Germany or Russia, that question would hardly be asked. But in England, a knowledge of Eastern languages was no stepping stone to diplomatic appointment, and the posts at universities were scarce. There was no value in it, or such was the common opinion of the time. Despite these obvious discouragements, I remained devotedly attached to my study of these languages. My honoured friend, teacher and Arabic scholar, Professor William Wright, gave me the kindest, wisest, most prudent counsel when he said, if you have the private means which render you independent of a profession, then pursue your oriental studies and fear not that they will fail to return you a rich reward of happiness and honour. Scarcely was I to know what and honour, and what a reward would come my way. In 1884, when I was searching through the books at the University Library at Cambridge, my eye was caught by the title of Count Gobineau's Religions and Philosophies of Central Asia. I glanced through the book, hoping that it would provide an account of the Sufis, which had been the primary object of my search. A considerable portion of the book was taken up with an account of the beginnings of the Baha'i religion, a belief system which I had at that time no definite knowledge of, save for the general idea that they had been subjected to a most severe persecution. I was eager to know more of the doctrines of a faith that had inspired the heroism and sacrifice that its early believers had demonstrated. I knew that if I were to succeed in fathoming the mysteries of this faith system, I must go to the land of its origin and strive to meet those who had devoted themselves to its ideals. Having completed my medical studies, it did not seem that fate would allow me the pursuit of my oriental dreams. 
returning to my rooms on the evening of May 30, 1887, I found a telegram lying on the table. I opened it with indifference, which changed the moment I grasped its context to utter joy. I had, that day, been elected a fellow of Pembroke College, and it was now that my long-held desire to visit Persia could finally be realized. It is a challenge to describe the rich tapestry of the language that I found during my visit to Persia later that same year. The melodious language which had for so long been realized in print and through occasional conversation with my Persian fellows surrounded me at every corner. The sights and sounds of this ancient and mysterious land seemed to leap off the pages of books and dance before me in all its wondrous splendor. After having spent a year among the Persians, my fascination with the embryonic faith of the Baha'i remained intact. While it had been difficult to meet many of these followers in Persia, for they remained a targeted and persecuted minority, in my travels I found faithful friends and good men and was met with much kindness. In 1890, I travelled to Akka. The chief purpose of my visit was to meet with the Persian Baha'is who had been exiled along with their prophet founder to the penal colony of the Ottoman Empire. My experience of the hospitalities of the, of the Persians in general, and the Baha'is in particular, could hardly have prepared me for the positive luxury which the thoughtful kindness of my hosts had provided. I rose the next morning to the arrival of fresh visitors. By the extraordinary deference shown to him by all present, I concluded that I was meeting none other than Abdul Baha, known to all as Abbas Effendi. <laughs> by the extraordinary deference shown to him by all present, I concluded that <laughs> I was meeting Abbas Effendi. He was a tall, strongly built man, holding himself straight as an arrow, with white turban and raiment, long black hair reaching almost to the shoulder, a broad, powerful forehead, indicating a strong intellect combined with an unswerving will. Such was my first impression of Abdul Baha. Subsequent conversations with him served only to heighten the respect with which his appearance had from the first inspired me. One more eloquent of speech, more ready of argument, more apt of illustration, more intimately acquainted with the sacred books of the Jews, the Christians, and the Mohammedans, could I should think scarcely be found. These qualities combined with a bearing at once majestic and genial, made me cease to wonder at the influence and esteem which he enjoyed, even beyond the circle of his father's followers, about the greatness of this man. None who had seen him could entertain a doubt. In this illustrious company, I did partake of a midday meal. Soon after its conclusion, Abdul Baha and others rose with a prefatory bismillah and indicated I should accompany them. We left the house, traversed the bazaars, and quitted the town through its solitary gate. Some time later, we alighted in front of a large mansion of the name of Baji. Here I was installed as a guest, amongst all accounts most noble and most holy of the beginnings of the Baha'i religion. And here did I spend five most memorable days. It was during these days which I enjoyed unparalleled and unhoped for opportunities of holding conversations with those who are the very fountainheads of that ancient and powerful spirit which worked with invisible but ever increasing force for the transformation and the quickening of mankind. It was in truth, a strange and moving experience, but one whereof I despair of conveying any 
save for the feeblest impression, I might indeed strive to describe in greater detail the faces and forms which surrounded me, the conversation to which I was privileged to listen, the solemn, melodious reading of the sacred books, the general sense of harmony and content which pervaded the place. But all this was as naught in comparison to the spiritual atmosphere in which I was encompassed. Of the culminating event of this journey, some few words at least must be said. The morning after my installation at Baji, I was conducted through the passages and rooms at which I scarcely had time to glance. Before a curtain, suspended from the wall of a great antechamber, my conductor paused for a moment while I removed my shoes. Then, with a quick movement of the hand, he withdrew. And as I passed and replaced the curtain, I found myself in a large apartment, along the upper end of which ran a low divan, while on the side opposite to the door were placed two or three chairs. Though I dimly suspected whether I was going, and whom I was to behold, for no distinct intimation had been given to me, a second or two elapsed. Ere with a throb of wonder and awe, I became definitely conscious that the room was not unattended. In the corner, where the divan met the wall, sat a wondrous and venerable figure, crowned with a felt headdress of the kind called Taj by dervishes, but of unusual height and make, round the base of which was wound a small white turban. The face of him on whom I gazed, I can never forget, though I cannot describe it. Those piercing eyes seem to read one's very soul. Power and authority sat on that ample brow, while the deep lines on the forehead and face implied an age, which the jet black hair and beard flowing down in indistinguishable luxuriance, almost to the waist, seemed to belie. No need to ask in whose presence I stood, as I bowed myself before one who is the object of a devotion and love which kings might envy and emperors sigh for in vain. A mild, dignified voice bade me be seated and then continued. Praise be to God that thou hast attained. Thou hast come to see a prisoner and an exile. We desire but the good of the world and the happiness of nations. Yet they deem us a stirrer up of strife and sedition, worthy of bondage and banishment. That all nations should become one in faith and all men as brothers that the bonds of unity and affection between the sons of men be strengthened and differences of race be, should cease and diversity of religion be annulled. What harm is there in this? Yet so it shall be. These fruitless strifes, these ruinous wars shall pass and the most great peace shall come. Such, so far as I can recall them, were the words which, among many others, I heard from him. <laughs> when I returned to Cambridge, Abdul Baha, the son of Baha'u'llah, wrote me a letter. Each time I read it, I am transported back to those days, as if despite the passage of time, my spirit has somehow lingered there. We always remember you and make mention of you. <clears throat> o kind friend, know this, that this bounty is a crown generously laid on thy brow, and in the course of centuries, it will be the pride and glory of all those related to you, all your kinsmen. We are always happy remembering you. Upon you be peace. The memory of those assemblies can never fade from my mind. 
the recollection of those tones and those faces no time can efface. I have gazed upon the workings of a mighty spirit, and I marvel whereunto it tends.